Yeah. Um, now we got uh, we've we fixed the shadow problem. <laughs> so um, now we can uh, more see it. It's the the uh, orange ring up top there. That is uh, the ring that the uh, ROV will just turn. Uh, I think it's about 10 degrees or something. Just a slight uh, turn, uh, and then it will release the locking dogs beneath there. And these. These guideposts, I've been uh, I've been on a few projects uh, with guideposts, and they range from everything from eight meters to sixteen. So you, you can have really long guideposts uh, like this, Be because the more um, the more gear that you are stacking on top of here, the the longer the guidepost has to be in order to to get it. So so on on some of the uh, templates and stuff, they have. Mm, their uh, their design basis is that they are putting everything on top of each other, so they end up having really long guideposts instead of just placing stuff uh, uh, alongside each other. So they they put them on top. So um, they can be really long, and and from a from a mechanical engineer perspective, that's that's a challenge because then you will get uh, when these uh, when these funnels that are supposed to hit up top there when they hit you can get a lot of sideways force, which means with a 16 meter long guidepost, you will get a whole lot of bending momentum going on inside this guidepost. So that, that's, uh, you, you have to really uh, look out for what, what, what's the usage of this guidepost, how, much, how many tons of force uh, or tons of weight would we, uh, would we uh, uh, say is the, is the maximum that it can, can handle up top there. So what, what, uh, what the uh, oil companies often do is that they have, maybe they have a BOP that's coming down, 250 tons or something, and then they say, well, uh, we reckon that around 10% of the weight of the BOP might uh, be uh, transferred as a sideways force onto the guideposts. Well, that means 25 tons, and then you have a 16-meter guidepost. That's that's uh, that's a lot. Then you have to really uh, think about the design you are doing because um, uh, finding 16 meter long pipes, you're not going to find that. So you're going to have to uh, weld pipes together anyway, which means that uh, it's this part of the guidepost that's going to to experience uh, the most amount of uh, bending force. So so th this is the critical point for the guidepost. Up here, it won't really it won't really matter that much. So you can have if say you have to have three pieces of uh, piping welded together in order to get 16 meters, then you can have uh, a fairly thick wall thickness down here in the first part. Then you can have uh, a slightly thinner wall thickness in the middle part, and then you can have your normal wall thickness on the top part. So you can sort of scale it a bit. And then you have to do calculations to, to check that each of, the, each of the sections and the welds are good enough and everything. So uh, it's it's a pretty uh, pretty intense job to work on these because usually, when you get to this point, this is uh, this is like the third or fourth uh, uh, chain uh, in in a project. So that w uh, Imenko is usually the subcontractor to the subcontractor of the subcontractor to the oil company, so that you have. You, you have like a lot of chains, and then no one has really thought about, oh, we need this equipment. So two weeks before they need it, oh, we need this equipment. And that, well, well, we have to do a lot of work here <laughs> in order to be able to, to, to create a bespoke solution for this exact situation, because this exact situation has uh, 25 tons up top there, and it's 60 meters long. That's not, that's not a standard product. So, uh, so that's uh, you, you. You can end up with having these sort of projects where you have really short deadlines uh, to do a lot of work. So, I've spent for for the one and a half years I worked with the Menko, I had at least three projects where I had to uh, often bring a, a laptop home and do calculations uh, in the evening after my kids had gone to bed. I just had to sit down in the office and start doing calculations. And my wife went to bed, and I was still doing calculations, <laughs> just racking up overtime uh, as it went along. So, uh, but but you, uh, when you're working for a small company, you do what you have to do uh, in order to get the job done. Because if you lose a contract like that, uh, there's usually a lot of money in it. So if you lose a, a contract like that, and it's a fairly small company, then 
it's going to have uh, quite an impact on on uh, on the profits of the company so you sort of just bite your uh, tongue and start working <laughs> so uh well that's the guidepost um but as you can see up top there's there's no wire connected to the top you can just barely see that there is sort of a a hole there up top and in that hole you send down a guide wire anchor so that um, I'm going to do a bit more on the guidepost just to show inside the top of the guidepost so you have like the top here you have a hole going down and then you have sort of a shoulder on the inside there. So uh, the length between the orange uh, ring here and the locking dogs uh, on the anchor is a bit longer than this length. So that when, when the uh, anchor goes inside here, it will continue on down until the top of the guidepost hits a shoulder up here right below the orange ring then the locking dogs will be far enough in here that they will pop out and then they can start pulling and the locking dogs will hit these shoulders so that they will stay in place there and then it is the the top of the anchor has the has the guide wire connected to it either through a a wire socket which is also a uh, something that you don't often see on land, but you see it a lot uh, in uh, in more marine environments, which is basically it's a conical conical shape. When you see it from the side, it looks like this, and if you do a cross section through it, you will see that it is uh, sort of like this. We'll do it so what they do is they they do the wire it has to be a bit smaller than the opening here so they use the uh, appropriate wire in here they push it in and then the wire is of course a lot of more uh, thinner steel wires that have been uh, been twined together so what they do is they start opening up the the twining so uh, so they they sort of spread it out so that they get loads of thin steel wires here going into trying to fill in, sort of fill up this opening and then they have this one uh, uh, switched up uh, switched around so that it's uh, on its head then they fill a resin inside here which will uh, sort of lock everything into place. So it's a, um, I think it's epoxy based, but I'm not quite sure uh, what it is they use. And so they fill this in here, so that will go in between all of the wire strands that are in here. We'll go in between all of them and onto the sides of the conical shape. And then it will just set there, so it will harden. So then when you pull on it, there is no way that you're going to get this wire out. So uh, at least not, the, the the bolts holding the uh, the uh, uh, wire socket in place will will uh, go before the wire is released from it. So, um, and act actually, I think there was a uh, there was an example of a bad design where they didn't have enough wall thickness up here. Uh, was a really old one where it, it actually started cracking from the strain put on the uh, wire so the wire was still stuck inside there but but you had actually the, this massive part of steel was starting to to crack so it's it's pretty amazing how how strong they can get those and and another way is just using a shackle so then you have uh, sort of a pad eye with a hole in it where you put a shackle in and that's the that's the more usual way of doing stuff, uh, at least on land. But, but on, uh, on offshore vessels, they often do this. And this is something that they usually do on the vessel itself. 
So they, they, uh, they uh, unfasten the bolts, they pull off the wire socket, and then they fasten it to the wire, because the wire is maybe three kilometers long, and it's spooled up inside somewhere, so they have to do it on the vessel. They can't, they can't do it on shore before they send, send the equipment onto the vessel. And uh, Imenko actually has uh, uh, a very good design on their guide wire uh, anchors. There is one other kind of guide wire anchors also, but it's not, it hasn't got this cool design that Imenko has. Um, you can see here on the side, there's a little dot there. There's a, a pin going through, all the way through there, and that's a shear pin. So it's been, it's been designed more or less You see it from the side, it's been designed like this, so it has two, two grooves in it that's been, uh, been turned out, out of the material. And it has been very closely calculated and tested and recalculated for each batch of material. They have to do this, so, so if they get the batch of, uh, say, uh, 10 rods that are uh, 6 meter long, then they can create a lot of these shear pins. And then they test the first three, of, uh, three or four or six of them, and then they, first off, they calculate how much uh, cross-sectional area do we need here for it to, to, to shear at the exact correct uh, force applied. And then they do some tests, and then they figure out that, well, this certain batch of material has, is a bit stronger than uh, what it usually is, so then we have to actually make it even smaller, this area. So they, they re redo the rest of them, and then they figure out Sort of like, uh, yeah. Yeah, you have, um, uh, I just removed the wire socket there. See. So you have the wall. Do it in a different color here just to uh, show. So I'll do this a bit more basic. It's a bit more complicated inside there, but just to show you what it, what the share stuff is uh, about. So the blue ones, if the blue ones are moving this way, and the red is moving this way. Then we will start to get, uh, th this will be the weakest point uh, of the pin. So if we'll start experiencing uh, shear forces in it. And if you uh, uh, calculate, like you have, uh, you, have this, uh, you have this material that the pin is made of, uh, it has a certain uh, yield limit, a, ten uh, a tensile yield, and uh, let us say the yield limit is uh, 235 megapascal, just for this one. Th that's, that's the usual for this material. But for this exact batch when they have created it, it might be 260 megapascal. You don't really know because it's always, uh, every time they have to, to put them... Uh, to create a new batch of materials, it will have slightly different characteristics. Even though they do everything exactly the same, their raw materials will always be slightly different, so that the characteristics of the finished product will always be slightly different. Uh, that's why we have these sort of standardized, um, uh, standardized yield limits, which means that when you have created a batch of a material, it has to have at least this, but it can have more. That just means it's stronger. So what they do then is that they create the first few uh, few pins, and then they start pulling them in, in a test jig. So they start pulling them, and they start measuring the force, how much force is needed to make this one shear. So if the calculation for 235 showed that, well, if we apply uh, 
20 kilonewtons, then it's going to break. But we, we start applying force, and then we end up at 25 kilonewtons. Then we know that, well, it's, it's, uh, the material is stronger. So then we have to sort of recalculate. Uh, we have to backtrace. We have to go from, we ended up with 25 kilonewtons. So then we have to backtrace to what will be the what will be the area, uh, the, the the sort of area that it should be then. If it's supposed to be uh, 25 kilonewtons, so then you try to sort of figure out what is the exact yield limit of this material. When you figure that out, that entire batch is uh, fairly fairly similar, so that you can uh, put it within a plus minus one percent range or something like that. Uh, and then you can start uh, putting these in because uh, what these shear pins do uh, in the in the guide wire anchors is that when they when they are broken, if if the ship starts pulling too much on this guide wire, when the shear pin breaks, the locking dogs are released. So then it releases its hold instead of uh, instead of uh, the entire structure being pulled and uh, all of the equipment being uh, uh, being put into a lot of tension, it will just release and then it will float up. So then they just have to pull it up to the surface, they have to replace the shear pin with a new one and then they can put it down again. So, so it's sort of a, a fail-safe mechanism to avoid pulling too much on this equipment because the equipment is supposed to stay on the sea floor, you can't start pulling it up, uh, everything. So that's the point with them. And the Imanka ones, uh, actually, the, the locking pins can rotate all the way around. So that when, uh, when it is going into, when it is going into the, uh, the uh, guide post, the locking pins are out there, but they will be when they hit this edge, they will be rotated inwards. And then when, the, when it gets down here, they will rotate back, so that it will be... They will rot rotate back out, so that they can uh, pull it back up and then fasten it to, to these uh, shoulders. But if they get too much tension and the shear pin breaks, the locking dogs will rotate this way, which means that it will just it will just let go of the entire shoulder and then it will just float straight up. <coughs> so it's a very nice design that they've done, uh, and the only the only real uh, uh, competitor that they have on the uh, guide wire anchor market, they create. They're, they're not they're not an engineering business so they had they created their guide wire anchor way back when uh, and they've just stuck with that design they haven't evolved it like Emenko has done Emenko has continually improved it so that they have gotten a really nice anchor because of this the Emenko anchors are of course a bit more expensive than the other anchors but the other anchors don't release as well and uh, also if you if you end up um, uh, if you end up uh, pulling them, uh, sort of, just to show it here, um, the other anchors they will rotate this way when they enter. They will rotate back when they get down underneath there. But when you're going to pull them out, they won't rotate that way by themselves. Uh, so, so you end up sort of breaking the shear pin, and they rotate this way. You have to pull it up to the boat, and you have to change the shear pin and everything. While um, the Imenko ones, when you when you rotate this, uh, when the ROV comes and rotates this one, the same thing happens as when the shear pin breaks, but without the shear pin breaking. So that then you still get this rotation. You pull it out, and as soon as it's out, they will pop back up again. So then they will return to this spot, which means that if you have several places, uh, let's say you have a huge subsea template with 12 wells that you're going to lower stuff down to, uh, onto all of the wells. When you're moving from one well to another, you only need to do the ROV, release the ring, 
they will pop down, you will pull it up, and when you get to the next uh, uh, next guidepost, the same thing will happen again. These will rotate up, up you will pull and push it down, and everything will work. So you can just move it straight over, while the other, the competitor, uh, they have to pull the uh, guide wire anchor all the way up to the boat in order to reset it. And so that's a huge advantage with these. So even though they are more expensive, they are usually at least uh, uh, from Statoil's point of view, they are usually choose choose the more expensive one if it means that they will use less time when they are out there working. <coughs> so we have the um, the uh, seabed here and the temporary base that's been been placed down with its guidelines to begin with. Uh, we get the uh, the first part of the hole is drilled so that we get a 30-inch conductor casing placed into the hole. It's cemented into place, and uh, uh, it's it's sort of hanging from the permanent guide base here uh, before it's cemented into place. And the permanent guide base has the guide posts, whether they are removable like the Amenko type, or if um, if it's an older system, they might be uh, just just permanent there. Then you can start lowering stuff. Here is the B, uh, blowout preventer on this one. So here you see sort of the, the guide funnels as they lower it down onto here. So you have the, the uh, top of the wellhead, um, sort of the connection between the casing hanger and the blowout preventer. And then you have the blowout preventer up top and then you have uh, some joints up here. Let's see what it says here. It's not that good to read always. Um, it's the yeah, it's the <coughs> it's a flexible joint, and then you have the drilling riser going up. And the the flexible joint is just if you get some some movements in in the uh, in the drilling riser, it's uh, supposed to handle it. So we continue on, uh, we have the BOP in place still, and now we are putting more casings in here. So we are getting several more casings, we are cementing those into place, just to get the, uh, the entire top of the well ready. Next step is even more casings in place, uh, just to get uh, all the way down. And uh, I got a question uh, during the break as to why do they keep uh, keep uh, uh, sort of uh, minimizing the diameter of, of the well as they're drilling down. Why, why are they using smaller and smaller drill bits? And I, I don't have a, a perfect answer to that, but, I, uh, but what I uh, think is the most likely thing is that basically it will take a lot longer to drill. As you are drilling uh, down with a huge drill bit, that will take longer than if you're drilling with a small one. So they are only using the large drill bits where they have to in order to place these casings into place. And then as they get deeper down and they don't need the casings anymore, then they can go over to the smaller drill bits and they can continue down to the reservoir. And also with a smaller hole, uh, you will also have a more controllable flow rate coming through it. So that you, instead of having a huge hole with a massive flow rate coming through it, it will be easier to because then you would have to sort of control the flow rate as it came up here instead, and that, that would be a strain on all of the equipment, so it's easier to just control it down by the reservoir. And, and the reason why they're using these casings and cementing them into place and stuff is that, of course, uh, the seabed here isn't as strong as the, the bedrock further down. So, so the bedrock further down, there, there's not a problem there if you drill a hole through it and you let, let all of this pressure into the hole. But as you come up here, you could risk, without those casing, you would risk it sort of blowing out to the sides here. So just blowing out the entire hole, basically. So that's why you would need this sort of strength up here in order to, to funnel it straight into the blowout preventer. Yeah, and then uh, as they have gotten all of the casings in, they lower down this completion riser, uh, which is basically inside the drilling riser here, all the way down. They have the uh, completion riser, which has uh, a sort of running tools, uh, it's called. Uh, so it has tools in it. 
It has a production packer, which is down here, uh, which I'm not quite sure what it uh, exactly does, uh, but it has to do with the production flow, and I think it is to sort of stop the production flow from going past the the uh, the flow pipe in the middle here. So sort of stopping it from just pushing past everything and uh, forcing it more into the, and the drill pipe. Then you have the subsurface, or this one is the surface controlled subsurface safety valve. The, the oil and gas industry are really fond of having uh, huge <laughs> abbreviations. So they, uh, they, can, uh, they can do the uh, most insane names and just abbreviate them completely. Uh, so you have that one in here. So as you can see, it is, it is, it follows its name. It's subsurface, so uh, it's uh, below the 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 surface of the sea floor. Basically, that's what they mean. Uh, so it's below, below there. Uh, and then you have uh, several plugs and uh, stuff up here. <coughs> Here's one that's not in the compendium, but it's just to show the the uh, surface controlled subsurface safety valve and how it works. So you have this pipe, and normally the flow goes straight through here, all the way up. Uh, but you have on the outside here, you have hydraulic pressure that comes down, and you have a a spring system here, and the spring system. Uh, is basically uh, counteracting uh, the hydraulic pressure is counteracting the spring system because normally if you had no hydraulic pressure in here the spring would pull on this flapper so that it would pull it closed so as soon as uh, something happens in your system and you lose your hydraulic power this flapper will close and it will block the production basically so that's the entire point with it it's it's constructed in such a way that if things fail then this one will close so, so which means that you are actively keeping it open all the time because if you are not actively keeping it open it will close by itself uh, and, th and that's a very nice uh, safety feature to have that it uh, that you know if you lose hydraulic power now if there's a power outage on the on the rig or, or vessel or whatever then this one is going to just snap shut so that you don't get a blowout uh, through your uh, christmas tree or anything so it's, uh, it's a nice uh, Nice illustration, this one. Here is sort of a uh, an illustration of the uh, Christmas tree and how it works. Um, it's not that easy to see up here, but uh, I'll do my best to to explain it. So you, ha you have quite a lot of different valves in the Christmas tree, and of course, it's the valves that give it its name of Christmas tree because the valves look like Christmas decorations, basically. Uh, you have the analyst swab valve and the analyst lower master. And the analyst is basically outside the production tube, inside the well, but outside the production tube. So that's the analyst. And uh, sometimes you will get, you will get uh, too high of a pressure. Uh, between these two, so you have to open a valve between them and sort of uh, bleed off the pressure and uh, and uh, equalize them uh, so that you don't get too high of a pressure difference. Uh, we'll get uh, more into the analyst part later on. Uh, you have production uh, valves, which are uh, master valves, uh, the first ones. So you have an upper and a lower one, so you have uh, the lower one first and the upper one second. Uh, and usually you only use one of them. That's uh, at least how I have understood the workings of these, is that you have two, but you use one mostly. Bec the reason you have two is that if the one that you are usually using, if it starts failing, then you can uh, start using the other one. You don't have to sort of shut, shut down your production and uh, exchange the entire valve or, or the entire Christmas tree. You still have one backup that you can use. Uh, then you have uh, the different wing valves and, uh, for the production line and for the analyst, uh, which is basically just uh, sending the, the production uh, out to the sides there, uh, production flow and stuff. 
And you have the surface control subsurface safety valve uh, down here. This is the, the last valve. Uh, this one was, was this the same or was it another one? 411, 410. Yeah, they put the production part up uh, up topper, uh, the tree cap up top. So that's why it's more or less the same. Uh, so now they lower down the, the tree cap and put this one up top here. Uh, so we have a ventilation line for the annulus, uh, so you can ventilate it if if you get too too high of a pressure inside it. Uh, and also for the production line, you can ventilate that one also. Uh, if you get too much, here is just to give you a, a sort of a clue of how these actually look, uh, because these illustrations don't give you much in the way of uh, appearances. And there are these two guys. I have no idea who they are. I just found them on uh, Google uh, Images. Uh, but I thought it was a good picture just to show the size of stuff. So here you have two grown adults uh, beside uh, a pretty large Christmas tree. You can't even see the top of it uh, in the image. And this one is a, a, uh, a 3D rendering of, of one down on the seafloor. So they are, they are pretty big. When they are, and and actually, uh, every once in a while here, you you will see them move between Stavanger and Bergen uh, on the roads here. You will see see these huge yellow uh, constructions on the backs of uh, large trucks driving them. So we've gotten to chapter five already. This is going a lot faster than I thought. <laughs> We're going to take a look at the seabed equipment. And uh, in the seabed equipment, we have the support base design, first off. We have a high pressure wellhead housing. We have the tubing hanger systems. And we have the wellhead connector for the Christmas tree. We have the Christmas tree itself. We have the uh, cap for the top of the Christmas tree. And we have the guiding system. We have a protective structure on top of that. And then we have the flow line system. And of course, we need to control all of this. So we're going to start uh, looking uh, through all of these. We have uh, first off the the support base design, which is which is the seabed frame, as it's called here, a fixed seabed frame, uh, which is basically the 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 temporary guide base, uh, which we saw earlier. Uh, and as we can see here, they've put in some hidden lines of that the the outer tube has been cemented below uh, the seabed. Here they have uh, a blowout preventer put on top, a stack of five units. And then we have the guide wires around here. They go up and down. And we have the automatic connector and universal ball joint. Also basically for the, for the riser tube to the surface. So the ball joint is to, to allow for, for movement in it. <coughs> and the support base down here, it has uh, several functions. It needs to, to carry the combined weight of everything that we put on top of it. And that's including the blowout preventers. And the blowout preventers are usually very heavy. So this means that the, the, uh, the seabed frame, it, has, it really has to be designed for what it's going to do. So it has to take into account the seafloor, the sediments, and everything there is... Is this something that is soft? Can it, uh, will it start sinking into the sediments, or do we have to uh, do we have to increase the area to avoid that? Uh, will will it handle all of the all of the uh, weight that we are putting on top of it? It has to do that, uh, and it has to, as I said, distribute it uh, properly to the seabed to avoid it 
uh, to avoid it sinking into it. It also has to be anchored in some way so that it can't be moved sideways or anything if, if something uh, should happen. What, what actually happens sometimes is that you have uh, uh, fishing ships, uh, trawlers, uh, they pull their nets along, uh, uh, along the surface, um, along the seafloor uh, surface, just to, uh, to catch uh, bottom dwelling fish and uh, shrimps and everything. And these are really huge nets, and they travel fairly uh, high speeds, so that uh, uh, trawlers have hit uh, subsea structures and uh, have actually managed to move stuff when they have hit them. There's also been, been problems with anchors that have been dropped by ships. Uh, ships dropping their anchors just to stay in place. Maybe there's a storm or anything. And sometimes they sort of uh, move as the anchor is uh, getting hold of something so that they end up dragging the anchor along the seafloor. The, this has happened that anchors have been dragged onto pipelines and actually moved pipelines several hundred meters because they have uh, sort of connected to them and the ship has just continued moving. So uh, it's uh, just making sure that this will stay in place uh, is, is quite a design job. And uh, <coughs> uh, it also needs to offer some, some guidance uh, for the stuff that we are lowering down. Uh, usually uh, it will guide just the first bits of equipment that we put down and then we will have, uh, have the... Uh, the, the ability to put down guideposts and guide wires and stuff. So, <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, for, for if we have single satellites, uh, so, so a single well where we don't have a huge template with, with several wells in one, it is uh, still common to use uh, the exploration style uh, drilling support base. Uh, which they use the sort of the the, the uh, temporary guide base, uh, which we saw earlier in, in the illustrations. It is still uh, normal to use that one I I if it's a single uh, single well. But if if it's a huge huge template where you have several wells, then of course you need to. There's going to be quite a lot of weight you're putting on top of there. So the entire template has to be built to to handle all of the blowout preventers that you're going to put on top of it and everything else. So, so that needs, uh, needs a lot more care. But if it's just a single well, then you already uh, sort of have the equipment in place from when you drill the hole, so that it will be, will be a bit easier there. <coughs> so and and it, also, uh, it also means that you can drill quicker if you're doing single wells and using the, the standard equipment there. So you can just move on to the next well and just continue working uh, instead of with the with the uh, huge, huge templates. You have to wait until the template is ready. You have to drill the holes. Uh, sometimes I actually think you have to put the template down first and then you have to drill through the template and stuff. So it's, it's uh, a lot more work when you're doing a template. So it needs quite a lot more organizing. So it's often uh, very much quicker if you're putting out single wells which can be, uh, of course, uh, you can save money if you're just putting out single wells then, and uh, you, you actually have the possibility of doing that. <coughs> but usually in, in the North Sea, outside of Norway and stuff, uh, it's most common to use templates where they, have, where they combine several well wells in, in one place when they're doing it. And usually the, the seabed uh, seabed frame, wh whatever it is you use there, if it's the temporary guide base or whatever, it is locked into place with the rest once once the rest is lower down. It's it's not just placed on top and just sitting there. It's actually locked into place with uh, physical locks. <coughs> yeah. Uh, the size of the reservoir will will definitely determine the amount of wells, and also, also not only uh, the size in in uh, res with regards to amount of oil or gas inside it, but also the size. As in, y you you can have a reservoir which is uh, which is fairly fairly thick, where you get a lot of oil inside it, but you can also have one which is really thin, 
So it's stretched out over a very large area. And then you sort of you have to have several wells then because you need to, to hit the correct spot. And for the thin ones, it's even worse because you have to figure out that uh, you, you, don't, uh, you don't want your production equipment to go past the reservoir. So if it just goes straight through the reservoir and then you have all of your, your perforated holes in your pipeline down here, then that's no good. You won't get much uh, out of that. So you want, you want your producing parts to be inside the reservoir. So, um, yeah? Uh, I know that there has been done some stuff on that, with uh, especially now that they can do the horizontal uh, stuff. So they, I know that they have uh, gone from one reservoir and basically come up beneath another reservoir and hooked up to it. So I know that it has been done, but, but I think it's... Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a drilling engineer, so I, I don't know what's, uh, what the problems are with it, but uh, uh, it's not done very often, so I think it's very difficult to do, basically. So, and if if it's difficult to do, it will most likely cost a lot of money, and then no one will will uh, will want to to waste money on it right now, at least. But uh, it it might be might be more in use uh, later on. But um, but but um, uh, like I mentioned in, in the in the break, also to a few of you, uh, this course isn't really to teach you how to drill uh, subsea wells or anything. It's just to give you an overview of the equipment in use, basically. Because as mechanical engineers, it is highly likely that you will be involved in uh, design and construction of such equipment. Uh, and then it's nice to know how everything works, at least. Because then you know if, if, if you get a, into, if you get a job and then you're suddenly put to, well, we are going to design a new blow-up preventer. And you're just sitting there like uh, you don't know anything about a blow-up preventer, never heard uh, of it before. Well, what's, what's that? So, so now at least you know what a blowout preventer is, you know what a Christmas tree is and everything. Is so, so that's why we're going through all of this, just to sort of give you an a, a understanding of what's happening out there. <coughs> so um, usually uh, when they are locking, uh, locking uh, stuff together here, uh, at least according to this appendix, it is done mechanically. Uh, but I am pretty sure that newer systems do it more or less hydraulically, most parts, because newer systems have very efficient hydraulic uh, systems, uh, and to not utilize that uh, hydraulic power to remote control stuff from the surface would be would be pretty uh, pretty stupid, actually. <laughs> when, when you when you have a functional control system and you have uh, hydraulic power going down there. Why not use it to to uh, do stuff? So, uh, unless it is possible for an ROV to uh, gain access, so that it can actually uh, can actually uh, uh, do the locking mechanism uh, with its manipulators and 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 do something there. So, <coughs> so uh, basically, when we are reading this appendix, if something seems old-fashioned or uh, done in a very roundabout manner. Uh, it is highly likely that there is a more efficient way of doing it now. Uh, just so you keep that in mind when you're reading it. The only problem is that uh, when you get to the subsea stuff, it is difficult to find a, a textbook that just do the basics. <laughs> but because then you have to go into the, the drilling engineers and stuff, and they have really complex uh, uh, textbooks. So... Well, they would basically think that your mechanical design textbook is really complex, also. But, but <laughs> it, it goes uh, each way there. But uh, it is uh, it is difficult to get a good textbook I inside this because there's not really that many people writing textbooks about the subject. So uh, the high pressure wellhead uh, that's uh, at the top of the well, so it's it's sort of between the Christmas tree or the blowout preventer and the well. So it's the connection uh, part there. So it is also where, uh, let's see if I can find it there. Yeah, it, it is also what provides the support for for uh, the casing strings and the conductors and everything that uh, that are uh, lowered into the hole. Those are those are hanging from uh, from the wellhead, basically from from uh, shoulders inside the wellhead where they are locked into place. So they're hanging down from that. 
Uh, this is just a, an example uh, from a company called Vetco. I think they are called Vetco Gray now, but I'm uh, not quite sure. Uh, here you see uh, sort of an illustration of it. Uh, on top here you have the connector for the Christmas tree or blowout preventer. You have the casings that go uh, down into the hole. They are hanging from uh, from uh, different points inside the uh, the wellhead uh, housing. Uh, and then you have the extension of the wellhead housing going further down into the hole. So we'll do a break and we have one more hour after that.
Okay, um, just a quick note before we, we continue. I've put up uh, on uh, Fronter, on the CAD part of the uh, mechanical design, I've just put a, a link to, to a short clip that I've created for uh, just showing sort of a tutorial on uh, how you can do your brainstorming and, uh, and the sketches that you're going to create for it. So uh, I've also put uh, an image of the sketches I create up there. So. So it's, uh, but, but uh, I, I would advise to watch the clip because uh, in the clip I sort of uh, give you the reasons why I am drawing as I'm drawing instead of just seeing the, the finished drawing afterwards. So it's uh, a, bit, uh, a bit nicer to, to, to get it with, with the sound uh, when you're looking at it. So yeah, that was just a, a quick tip. That's, uh, that's something you can, uh, can use. And, and uh, uh, Thursday and Friday I'm at uh, Stod for my own studies. Uh, so you will have the uh, you'll have 1093 on your own with uh, with students assistants uh, three of them I think it is uh, I think Gabriella was going away uh, tomorrow I think uh, and um, uh, wh whether you start working on practice task one and two or if you uh, uh, work on your brainstorming with your uh, with your uh, team uh, for the project that's uh, up to you what you do that but but uh, the room is available uh, at least for, for CAD studies and uh, the students' assistants won't be won't be doing attendance uh, for for this week, so uh, the attendance will only be done by me when I am present for lectures. So, so you you can decide if you want to show up in 1093 and work with the practice tasks in Evento, or if you want to sit somewhere else and work with your team project or or, or whatever. So, that that's uh, completely up to you for this first week. So. We will start off from scratch uh, next week anyway on, on practice task one. So it's up to you if you want to, uh, what you want to do, if you want to get a head start or anything. <coughs> yeah, um, back to the wellhead. Uh, this one, it is a bit difficult. To, uh, I got a question uh, about where is the wellhead uh, in this illustration? And it, it is really difficult to show it because it's sort of behind everything here uh, at the top of the hole and between the top of the hole and and the uh, blow-up preventer. So it's really difficult, to, you can't really see it in, in this illustration. But it is at basically at the top of the hole and then a bit further up and then the blow-up preventer is connected directly onto it. Uh, because the, the blow-out connector connects to this part here. Uh, and, and, and this part, connector part, isn't really a part of the wellhead. The wellhead stops up here. Uh, but, but this is just shown to get, uh, get a feeling of where where does the blow up preventer connect in this one, uh, and this particular uh, particular wellhead uh, is for uh, ten thousand psi uh, of pressure, which translates to about six hundred ninety bar. So it's for uh, for a mid range uh, field. Uh, I know that. You can easily get a thousand to fifteen hundred uh, somewhere around there uh, in in some of the fields. Depends a bit on how how far down they are because you get the same you get the same, get the same uh, effect as you get on the hydrostatic pressure. Basically, uh, the further down you get, the higher the pressure becomes. So so the deeper the reservoir is, the more pressure you will have inside it. And not only because you will have this huge weight of uh, of seawater on top of the seafloor pushing that one down but you also have a huge amount of stone on top of it that's lying uh, and just pushing down on the on the reservoir um, i don't uh, think it will be mentioned in process technology so i might just mention it basically um just so you know how the reservoirs are formed uh, and everything we uh, you remember the first Lecture, we talked about these tectonic plates that are moving uh, and everything. Uh, this means that basically the ground we are standing on, it is something that keeps moving. It takes millions of years for, for, uh, for it to be, uh, be really noticeable to, to us, uh, except from volcanoes and earthquakes. So, uh, so uh, the really big changes we won't ever see in our lifetimes. Uh, but what sometimes happens is that you can get, so if you had, uh, have this seabed here, uh, and you can get sort of a layer of a very hard rock that's going up here, and then it's crashing into another layer of a very hard rock. So you have sort of two layers of very hard rock here. There is no way for oil to penetrate through this rock because it's so compact. There are, there are no holes in it for, for the, the oil to travel in. 
So all of the, the, the oil, uh, um, uh, do, do you know where oil comes from? Th that it's basically uh, millions of years old uh, plant waste uh, and biological waste. So, so it's uh, carbon-based uh, uh, stuff, uh, old trees, leaves, animals, anything that has died and been collected in uh, huge, uh, huge uh, areas sinking into the the ocean floor being covered over by uh, by uh, uh, different uh, natural phenomena and stuff uh, and when it sits in high pressure it slowly turns to oil or coal so that you get either oil or coal either you get the the, the pure carbon of uh, of coal or you get the oil uh, stuff and from the oil you also get the gas uh, and, and if this forms down here below these two layers of hard rocks it will slowly seep up because it's it's uh, it will always move up to the surface just like if you pour oil into water it will it will uh, gather at the surface because the density is lower so it will slowly move upwards but sooner or later it will start hitting this this layer of very hard rock so it will start forming forming a reservoir of oil here and as as the years uh, pass on hundreds of thousands and millions of years the, the oil will start to gather more and more there and then you get a uh, get a reservoir so that's actually what they're looking for when they are uh, driving their seismic uh, ships uh, uh, all over the world basically they are looking for these formations of hard rock and they are looking that uh, could there be a pocket here where uh, where uh, oil could be trapped inside the pocket and that's when they go in with drilling ships and they start drilling down and seeing if is there anything here and if they if if nothing pops up when they have drilled it then I'm, well, okay there, there wasn't anything there we have to move on to the next spot so that's basically how how these reservoirs form uh, way below the surface so it's a it's a pretty pretty cool that uh, something that's been going on for millions and millions of years actually end up be, being something we can exploit right now. Uh, of course, it's not that good for our, uh, our atmosphere and our environment, but uh, <laughs> the, 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 the banks doesn't, uh, don't bother with that. <laughs> they just bother with money. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think we'll, we'll be moving away from oil uh, anytime soon, really, no matter how much uh, people are concerned about the environment. Uh, I think we will be moving away from it uh, as a fuel for our vehicles. Uh, we will be moving away from it there and moving over to electric and other stuff. But uh, uh, still, uh, th that's not where most of the oil goes. Most of the oil goes to creating plastic, actually. So, so oil is a very important part in creating different kinds of plastic. So uh, uh, it's uh, pretty, pretty amazing that uh, that so much oil is used for that. Uh, uh, actually, the um, you, you know about Legos, the the building blocks uh, for kids, not just kids. Uh, both me and Frederick love building with them, so <laughs> it's not for kids uh, only. Uh, those are made from uh, from what's called ABS plastic, and you've probably seen that on uh, on, on uh, if you have uh, plastic. Uh, stuff at home, uh, a plastic cup or, or whatever. If you look at the underside, it might just say ABS on it. That's uh, there's a, it's a very uh, very durable kind of plastic. It uh, it's it's pretty strong. It can uh, withstand a lot, and uh, and it and it keeps over time. It, it's very uh, it doesn't degrade over time, and that's made from oil. But Legos, they are creating like. I think it's like billions and billions of these Lego pieces almost weekly that is <laughs> distributed across the world. So they are like, well, we, we have to look at this. We, can, we, we have to try to find something equal to the ABS uh, plastic created by, by oil. Uh, we have to find something more environmentally friendly, something without oil in it, but that still keeps the same, uh, same properties as the ABS plastic. And for now, they haven't found it. Uh, they are still working on it. But I know that when, when I was studying a few years ago, there was a huge uh, recruitment process that they had going. I, I think they recruited like 150 materials engineers uh, to try to start working on this, trying to find a solution to, to it. So, so they, were, uh, they had a massive campaign both in, because they, they have their uh, main office in Denmark. 
they had a massive campaign in Norway and Sweden and Denmark and Britain and uh, uh, Germany and all of the neighboring countries just to try to get enough engineers to come and start looking at this problem. So it's uh, it's a pretty a pretty um, pretty nice that such a large company is trying to move away from from oil-based plastic. But still, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon that uh, we get away from it completely. So oil is here to stay for now, maybe a bit less activity than what it has been uh, as we go along year by year, but, but it will, will definitely not disappear completely. Um, this wellhead, uh, as we've already said, you're connecting this really heavy blowout preventer on top of it, and it is not really doing much than just sitting down into, uh, into the top of the well. It's of course locked into place on top of the well and, and everything, but, but it basically has to uh, handle all of the weight and, uh, and all of the movements also in the riser with this flexible joint that we've been uh, looking at uh, at the top uh, here. This flexible joint which allows for some movement because there will always be a little bit of movement up top, uh, especially if it's a very long uh, riser tube. Uh, the, the longer it gets, the more movement you will have because you will always have uh, you will always have a lot of ocean currents that will be working on the side of the, uh, the riser so that the longer it becomes, the more likely it is that the riser will actually be shaped more like this when it comes down to the, uh, down to the subsea well, that it will be uh, going in an arc because you have this ocean current that's pushing on it. And uh, it's so flexible that it has to sort of give way there. <coughs> uh, so this, this uh, not, not only does it have a lot of weight pushing it down, but it also have these sideways forces that it's getting from, from the ocean currents and everything. So, so these really have to be strong, these wellheads. They have to handle a lot of, uh, a lot of forces when, they are, uh, when they're working. So there's a lot of different uh, dimensions and type. They're, they're listing a lot of them, like... Uh, 21 and a quarter inch uh, by 2000 PSI, stuff like that. That's not important for you guys. Don't bother uh, trying to memorizing any of that stuff. There's no point in memorizing anything anyway because you have, you're allowed to bring it to your exam. <laughs> so you can just read it on your exam instead of uh, trying to remember it. But, uh, but, but that's not the important part there. That's more important if you're uh, really looking at these uh, systems. But uh, the important part to keep in mind here is that there are many types of wellheads. And what actually happens is that the choice of wellhead is not always as to what is best for this exact well. It might just be that uh, uh, the drilling rig that is available at that time can put down a wellhead of this type. So then they just put down a wellhead of that type instead of waiting until another vessel, uh, maybe a, li a bit larger vessel, is uh, available to, to put down a stronger wellhead. So that it is still strong enough, but, but it, uh, if it had been even stronger, you might, have, uh, you, you might not have to shut down production during uh, winter storms and stuff, uh, just to be on the safe side. So if, if, it had been, if you had waited a bit for that other drill rig to be ready, that could put down a stronger wellhead, you might have been able to run production during the uh, the entire year instead of having periods where you actually have to shut down your production. So that's a um, and that's a, a, a pretty weird thing to think about. Everything is so well thought through when they are doing these subsea uh, stuffs, and then suddenly something will be decided. Just ah, just use what's available. It's, <laughs> it's sort of uh, weird when you are thinking about it, but. Uh, that's how it is. The, uh, my impression from the oil and gas industry is that they often have, uh, they often put deadlines on themselves that are almost not achievable, so that everyone is just running around uh, as though they are whipped rats or something. That they're just bah, trying to get everything done in, in time because someone has said that this has to be done by that date. Uh, and instead of just, well, if we had given them five more weeks, then we probably would have gotten a better solution. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's often uh, 
uh, it's often been that things are moving too quickly in the oil and gas industry. And then uh, suddenly uh, something happens like two years ago where the oil price just drops completely. And then for the five or six years before that, it had been a complete rush here in Norway because there were so many projects that were being started that there weren't enough suppliers to do all of them. So that suppliers were giving themselves even shorter deadlines to finish the product, uh, project they were working on because they had to move on to the next project because someone was pushing them to, uh, to do that project also. So it uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of defeats the purpose that they, they, they keep doing this and then they end up with, uh, with lower oil price and suddenly you have to lay off what was the last uh, number I heard yesterday was 38,000 jobs in the oil and gas industry in Norway that have been completely gone now. So we have here in here in uh, Rogaland we have uh, I think it's 12,000 that are out of employment right now that, that come from the oil and gas industry. It's it's pretty pretty heavy to b to be in Norway where up until two years ago we were one of the European countries with the lowest work unemployment rate. So now we are uh, sort of mid range again. And th and, th and then you're taking into consideration Spain and uh, and Greece that have huge problems with their unemployment rates. They have skyrocketing unemployment rates. And even with those into the equation, we are still mid-range now. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. Uh, but then again, uh, I think most people that have, uh, have uh, lost their jobs and stuff now, they, they only need to sort of adjust to a, a lower income and then they would get a new job. So I, th I think that's what... Uh, Many people just have to sort of uh, realize that they have to, they have to, uh, they, they can't expect to get the same income as they had in the oil and gas industry and get the same income if they're working onshore. That's uh, not really, not, not really something that they can get. They, ha they have to uh, have a lower income when they start working onshore. So I think uh, I think it will work out <laughs> as we move along, but there will be a few years here where there are lots of people unemployed. So yeah, we have the loads on the high pressure welded system. As I said, the static casing weight loads, which is basically just everything, the weight of everything that is connected to the both the things that are are hanging down from from inside here, the weight of those, and everything that's connected to the top of the wellhead. Those are the loads on the wellhead system. We also have the in-pressure loads, so the pressure inside the wellhead, so, so the pressure coming from the, uh, the uh, oil reservoir. So in this case, uh, the wellhead we were just looking at could, uh, could handle up to 690 bars. So it would have to be used on, a, on an oil reservoir where the pressure was lower than 690 bars. Most likely there would be uh, some sort of uh, safety factor uh, involved here. So uh, the 690 bars, maybe it was uh, multiplied with uh, 1.5 to get the actual braking limit so that you could, could have 690 multiplied with 1.5 and then you would start to become, become worried that it would actually break. But uh, it's, uh, it, it's useful to stay below the given limits instead of starting to gamble with, uh, with safety factors. That's actually something that's done a lot. Uh, we will see it a bit later when we are looking at uh, operations done offshore. Uh, because you will have equipment that has a certain limit, like the, the working load limit that you will uh, design your, your lifting equipment from. They will, um, will probably have a working load limit on the equipment, but they need to do something that is way, uh, way above the working load limit. So then they would will go into go to the supplier and they will basically ask, well, what is the maximum? Wh when will it break? So how, how big of a safety factor you ha do you have? So if it's, if it's a 10 ton working load limit and you have a safety factor of five, that means that at 50 ton, this one is going to break, most likely. But, but again, like uh, we saw with the, with the share pins, the materials might actually be stronger than what has been calculated. So it might actually uh, handle 52, 53 tons before it breaks, but uh, the, 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 the design calculations say that it will break at around 50 uh, tons. So then they might go in and say that, well, we really need this equipment to handle 30 tons right now. 
then the manufacturer, like if it was an Imenko product, Imenko would say that, well, you're welcome to do what you want with the equipment that you've bought, because that's your equipment. It's not ours anymore. But we won't say that this is uh, this will go uh, go without any problems. There won't be an accident or anything. That's not not something that we can guarantee. But we can do an analysis of it and say that well, there's a probability of uh, two percent that this will this will uh, end in an accident or something. And then the then the operator has to sort of decide if is this is this good enough? Can we? Uh, can we accept this uh, risk? And if they accept it, then they actually perform the, the operation and use the equipment up to 30 ton, as they uh, had intended. B because the equipment will, 99.9 .9 times, it will handle at least the maximum uh, load uh, that's been calculated, as usually it will handle a lot more. But then there might be some some flaw in manufacturing or anything, just a tiny tiny thing that might mean that it actually it wasn't capable of doing 50 tons. It wasn't even capable of doing 30 tons. So something might happen. Um, you can't guarantee that when you're going way above the safety factors. And that's <coughs> that's something that's done every now and then for offshore uh, stuff because basically you can't. If you're in the middle of an operation offshore, you have equipment on board. You can't just stop because, well, oh, this equipment isn't strong enough for this exact task, or we're going to do something. If you have a, a lifting equipment, it's designed for lifting. It's not designed for pulling something. So if you're going to pull with it, then you sort of have to go through everything again and see, ah, is this something we can do? So every now and then you get... Uh, when I was working with Emenko, I got a uh, request that, well, can we, using this uh, equipment of yours, can we pull with uh, 30 tons uh, instead of you lifting 10 tons with it? So then we sort of had to sit down, a couple of engineers, for a few hours, just discuss it, calculate on it, and then we had to go get back with, a, with, a, with an answer, because then they were actually offshore on the ship waiting for our answer if they could start doing this or not. So it's, uh, because if, if they couldn't do it, if we said, well, it's going to break if you do this, then of course they would have to cancel the operation, they would have to uh, send the ship off to do some the next operation it was supposed to do, and then they have to try to figure out, basically design a completely new tool to do the job. And that's uh, a lot more expensive than sort of doing a calculated risk of of uh, uh, breaking the the safety factors so that's something that has to be done done on a on a uh, situation to situation basis you have to really really look at the situation before you decide to do something like that uh, you also have the environmental bending and axial loads as i mentioned from the riser as it's moving and everything it's it's going to put bending stress on the uh, on the wellhead <coughs> so we have uh, the tubing hanger uh, system uh, here it is shown with a landing tool inside it um, so we have the this is the uh, blowout preventer this part and uh, we have the landing tool coming down here and as it, it's a bit difficult to see it, but they have sort of a spiral uh, a spiral cut here, just to show that as this landing tool is coming downwards, it will hit the end of the spiral, and then it will start rotating until it hits the bottom of the spiral. And then it will be uh, rotated into, into the correct position. So this, this spiral will be uh, more or less almost a, a complete uh, turn. So that if it hits the top of the spiral, it will turn around almost a com almost 360 degrees, and then it will stop as it hits the bottom. If it misses the top exactly, then it will just continue down and hit the bottom part of the uh, the spiral, and then it will rotate a couple of degrees, and then it will be in place. Then it was almost oriented correctly f from the from the start. But that's one way of of getting it into the correct position when they are are putting it down there. And from the uh, landing tool, you have the tubing hanger running tool. <laughs> uh, 
and then you have the tubing hanger. So you, you start, you have a tool that will start uh, uh, start installing the tubing. So it will, it will, it's called a hanger because it's basically it's hanging from, <laughs> from from the wellhead. Or the inside, uh, yeah, it's from the wellhead. It's hanging. <coughs> Uh, one thing uh, that you see here, this is the blowout uh, preventer. You see, they, they are calling it uh, a certain uh, certain size and then RAM. And that's basically how these blowout preventers work. They work as RAMs, so they, they, they just completely, they just cut off completely. They RAM them in place when they need to cut off everything here. So, so if, if something happens, they get a blowout up top and they need to shut down everything, they just lock these in there. There's a lot of hydraulic pressure going into this and just slamming it in there and they, they, they just cut the piping straight off with them and then they are, they are completely blocked and with with four of them in succession also then you're going to get when all of them just slam in there you are, you have a you have a completely locked off system of course you've you've destroyed everything that was inside here so <laughs> so, so uh, if the blowout preventer has to be used then then there's uh, there's a whole new operation that you have to do with maintenance, with replacing parts and everything uh, afterwards. So, uh, so um, ideally, you wouldn't want a blowout preventer to 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 be engaged any time. But still, if it is engaged, it is at least uh, engaged in order to avoid a more serious accident up top. So you've probably heard about the Deepwater Horizon uh, accident with this huge spill and uh, many lives lost and everything down there in, uh, in the Caribbean Gulf. Uh, that, uh, if I'm not completely incorrect here, uh, I think that was something wrong with the blow-up preventer. It didn't, it didn't uh, uh, cut off everything, so that uh, they ended up with this uh, uh, hefty leak uh, that they had and, uh, and the, the accident up top. Uh, I think it's both automatically and and manually operated b b because I think it's supposed to. I won't say this completely sure uh, because I'm not 100 percent sure, but I but I think it has some systems in place to to so so that it will automatically cut off if uh, uh, some some certain conditions are met um, because then the, uh, something bad will happen. But I think they also have the possibility of overruling and just uh, slamming a switch on top of the uh, surface vessel, and then it will just shut off everything. So, uh, but in the deep water horizon, I, I think it didn't work properly or something. There, there was something there. They, they were telling it to, to cut, but it didn't cut or something. I'm not quite sure there, but actually I think there's coming a, a movie out uh, that's called Deep Water Horizon. I think it's Mark Wahlberg or something in the, in the main lead there. So it's it's about the the accident, and uh, I think he's supposed to be one of the workers on the rig when the accident happens. So could could be quite interesting to uh, to watch uh, when it's released. I'm not sure if it's released yet or if it's uh, coming sometime during the next months. Um, yeah. I'm not quite sure what the bag preventer is exactly. Uh, I think I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. I'm going to note it here. Um. So because uh, I don't think it says anything in the... Um, It doesn't mention it in the text, so I'm not quite sure what it is, but I, I'll try to figure out what it is for, uh, before uh, we have the next lecture so, so that we can uh, go back to it and, uh, and mention it. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, it is locked into place uh, with a cam spool. Uh, let's see if we get that. Didn't I have that one here? No, that one is uh, a bit later on. So uh, I'll show you the cam spool a bit later on because we're we are going to, to talk a bit more about it uh, later on. So we have the 
that was the subsea tree equipment. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the the subsea tree equipment is the the Christmas tree itself, and it is usually either installed by use of a diver or by an ROV. Uh, more and more, we are only using ROVs nowadays because divers can't can't work all that deep, at least here in Norway. So, so uh, usually it's an ROV, I would say. Um, and the design of the uh, Christmas trees, they vary enormously from, from manufacturer to manufacturer, exactly how they look. It's, it's always a bit different because everyone has sort of invented the wheel once again <laughs> and figured out their own way of doing stuff. Uh, so e each company has their own way of creating uh, the the Christmas trees. But in effect, all of them are doing the exact same thing. So th uh, again, that's one of, the, uh, one of the points where standardization would have been a nice thing to have 30 years ago in the, in the uh, oil and gas industry. If this had been, if the use of such equipment had been standardized, that's uh, sort of a, a if, uh, it if it was a NORSOC standard or, or whatever other standard that just told them that uh, a Christmas tree for uh, for an uh, for an oil reservoir in this pressure range is supposed to look like this. Then everyone would have created them like this, uh, like that. They would have done their own design calculations and everything, but everyone would have had the same connections and everything. So you could, could you didn't have to go to one company and now you are going to create this entire well, because none of your stuff matches up with any other people's stuff, so we can't sort of switch around. So I if everyone had been using the same standard when they were, uh, were designing, uh, uh, it would have been a lot easier nowadays. Uh, but they are slowly trying to, to force standardization into, into it, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I would have thought actually that it is an advantage to, to, to everyone involved uh, because uh, it means that if you are uh, the only ones that can really uh, really produce full systems now are the really big ones like Akar, Abel, uh, stuff like that. And they are the ones that have, have the resources to do such massive stuff. But you have plenty of other companies that are experts on a s particular type of valve for an example, so, so if they could come in and put their valve into someone else's tree, that would have been uh, a huge plus for them. So of course the big ones, Akar and uh, everyone like that, uh, they would have uh, lost some work uh, if this had been the case uh, with a lot of standardization. But I think for the most part, every, uh, the whole industry would have gained something from it. So, so the big ones would have uh, had uh, a bit less to do, and uh, everyone else would have a lot more that they could do. So, so I think it's uh, all in all, it would be a positive thing. But, but certainly for, for specific companies, it would have been a bad thing because they are making a lot of money <laughs> doing everything <laughs> right now. <coughs> uh, yeah, but well, the, the the different designs for the Christmas tree vary greatly. Uh, I've already talked about vertical and horizontal trees, and there are several others that we are going to look at later on in the, in this appendix. Uh, mainly, what differences them is uh, how you can can do work down uh, downhole work. If you have to do the through flow line method, or if you have to, uh, or if you can use the the wire line method. Uh, we actually have a company here uh, out on uh, Karmey, which is uh, called Deepwell. Uh, so they uh, they specialize in wire line equipment. So they have uh, loads of different uh, stuff that they can lower down on a wire into the hole, and they will they can actually go all the way down to the, the bottom of a well uh, with their, uh, some of their equipment. So so they actually have so e even the, the even the horizontal wells that are going going flat. They have uh, specially designed sort of tractors that are pulling the wire along when they because they're lowering it until they hit the point where it's horizontal and then the tractor will start sort of moving and pulling the wire along uh, further and further into the well and then they can do work very deeply into the wells. So it's, uh, it's uh, sort of a niche uh, product. 
but still, it's uh, the, the the few companies that are dealing in this. They are uh, having plenty to do uh, usually. Uh, right now, they have a bit less to do since there is so little activity. But uh, usually, they uh, are overworked. <laughs> Uh, we have the tree wellhead connector, which is uh, basically the same as for the, the blow-up preventer, only now we're going to connect the tree to it. Because when you're, when you're switching the blow-up preventer with a Christmas tree, uh, you have to connect it some way, and it's more or less the same. Again, uh, it says mechanical or hydraulical. I would believe that most newer stuff is hydraulical. <coughs> and you use them to connect the wellhead to the Christmas tree. We can also use such connectors to connect the tree cap of the Christmas tree to the top of the Christmas tree. Uh, and if you, if you remove the tree cap, you can uh, connect a running tool to the top of the Christmas tree using the same connector type. And also different production lines can be connected with this uh, connector type. So we're going to look at it uh, now afterwards. Uh, these are usually usually operated with a uh, with an ROV. I think uh, at least. Um, so what it does is you put it onto whatever it is you're connecting, whether it's a pipeline, or it's a tree cap, or it's a Christmas tree. And these uh, different cutout parts here, they will start locking and unlocking regarding where they are putting the hydraulic pressure in. Yeah? Uh, when you're done, uh, when, you're, when you're finished drilling your well and everything, and you're going to start producing, you can't produce uh, you won't produce through the blowout preventer, so you you exchange it with the Christmas tree. So when you start producing, you want the Christmas tree there. So I, I, I think there are some systems where they actually keep the blowout preventer, then they just put the Christmas tree on top of the blowout preventer. But uh, I think for, for most systems, they actually they uh, they switch it out. So so then they have like uh, they have a certain amount of blowout preventers for one field, and that blowout preventer will fit all of the wells. And then if they need to do something on uh, one or two or three of the wells, they will have enough blow-up preventers for those. Uh, but, but they can't do something on a absolutely all, all of the wells because the blow-up preventers, they are, they are really expensive. So, so you, don't want to, you don't want to fill up your warehouses with a lot of blow-up preventers that aren't, or just keeping them down on the wells if you can sort of reuse the same blow-up preventer for, for, for uh, several tasks. So. Uh, yeah? Yeah, you're not using the Christmas tree when you're drilling because you're not producing anything when you're drilling. You're th the only thing you're doing is you're, you're drilling, so you are removing the mud that you're drilling. So, so all of the all of the stuff that has been uh, sort of ground up by the drill bit is being uh, removed. But that's actually more like a, a pumping, uh, pumping it up instead, because then you don't have the reservoir pressure that's pushing it up. So then you more have to uh, to to attach pumps and start pumping it up instead. Um, yeah, um, there are some movable uh, or sliding rings uh, in inside the connector, uh, and uh, if you apply hydraulic pressure to different parts of it, then these rings will slide up and down, and they will end up. Uh, I think it's up and down, or is it up and down, or they will start rotating? At in this case, it's up and down on this one, and it will sort of clamp shut on it so that it will connect it completely. Uh, and it will stay there with the uh, with the uh, hydraulic pressure. Uh, and I think also after you've clamped it, you can mechanically uh, sort of lock it in place so that if you lose your hydraulic pressure, you won't lose your connection. Uh, yeah, it's uh, locked in place by uh, cam spools also. So there are locking dogs uh, connected with a cam spool. Uh, the best way of showing that is uh, this is a camshaft from an engine, and this is what controls the valves opening in the, in the cylinders in the engine. And basically, you have uh, a cylindrical uh, axle going through a uh, cylindrical shaft going through all of this, 
but on different uh, places of the shaft you have these elliptical shapes that have been placed into it, which means that uh, they don't have the same center. So if you have the, the shaft itself is going through here, but then you have these elliptical parts that are sort of off-center. So that when this one rotates, if you have something, uh, something here, it will rotate, it will hit the edge of this, it will push this away, and as soon as it's gotten over on this side, this will snap back into position. So um, that's how it's uh, opening and closing the valves uh, in an engine. It's sort of just pushing these, uh, these valves open, and then as soon as it moves away from it, uh, the same can be done using a circle. Uh, so uh, you can, this will be more like a linear rotating motion, but here you have uh, uh, an entire ring that is filled with these little cams. So that when you, when you rotate this ring, these cams will start pushing on, on the locking dogs. So when you rotate it, you only need to rotate, rotate it enough that this top ends up over here. And then you have pushed the locking dogs into place, and it, it will be locked there. And then you have to continue rotating the ring in order to unlock it. So if you just leave the ring where it is, it will be locked into place. Uh, so th that's one of the ways that they, they, they keep these locked. Um. I actually think we're, uh, we're going to stop there. We'll, we'll continue with this figure uh, next week. So it's, uh, it's no point in uh, starting on a new subchapter and not, not completing it. So that was all for this week. Uh, there will be no underwater technology on Thursday, and you are left to your own devices in the CAD on Thursday and Friday. But uh, try to use your uh, time wisely and uh, do some uh, productive work. So, and then I'll see you all uh, next Tuesday. I'll be in the office tomorrow, uh, just so you know. So.